<laughs> Sorry about this. Here, I'll, I'll take it down and I'll get it going. Are you sure? Yeah. I might, I might give Charles just a minute to <laughs> see if we can get this PowerPoint up. So if you'll excuse us for one second. Excellent. <laughs> this is also my first PowerPoint presentation, so I'm sure there'll be a few more glitches along the way, so please uh, forgive me. No problem. Thank you. And I just do... Just that fellow there. Lovely. This one? Yeah. Okay. And Thanks. then go back if okay. you want. If you Thank need. you. Um, well, look, good evening, uh, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be back here again in Glenties for the second time. And I'd like to thank, to thank Joe for his kind invitation uh, to talk, discuss, and hopefully debate later on with all of you. I'm going to start um, my talk this evening with a, an extensive interview that I did back in late November 2015 with the HSE Director General, Tony O'Brien, who's obviously on the panel here today. In that interview, and it was a very brave interview that he did, he stated that the health service was suffering from the lack of a coherent vision or plan. Memorably, Tony described the HSE as an amorphous blob that had been on death row for years. He said Ireland had messed about with structures in the absence of a coherent vision. We don't have a single coherent or collective national understanding of what we want from healthcare, he said. Mr. O'Brien's comments greatly annoyed many members in government at the time. Unfortunately, it is rare to see senior public servants say anything that might irritate their political masters, but it was hard for anyone to disagree with what he actually said. He initiated an important conversation. The truth is that the health service has been dogged by continuous policy change. After each election, we begin the new electoral cycle where a new political administration introduces a raft of new policies. You don't need to go back very many years in order to see this. In 2010, the Fianna Fáil government, Fianna Fáil-led government, I should say, was pursuing a policy of hospital co-location. Consortia tendered for these hospitals. It was at a very, very advanced stage. Then Fianna Gael and Labour came to power. The co-location plan was axed. Fianna Gael and Labour promised to introduce universal health insurance, we were all supposed to receive that last year, by the way. A key report called Future Health set out the building blocks that we were told were required prior to the introduction of universal health insurance. The government then established the stepping stones for UHI, hospital groups as a precursor to hospital trusts in much the same way as they have in the UK. The hospital groups, as Rona mentioned earlier in her speech, are not functioning in the way that many hoped they would. The trusts just weren't established. Unfortunately, the government didn't do its homework on the prices. The plan for universal health insurance was dropped after the ESRI said the costs would be enormous. Last year, a group of cross-party TDs, the Committee on the Future of Healthcare, was tasked with developing a vision for the health service. Tony O'Brien's comments and indeed efforts by the National Association of GPs and Roisin Shorthall were germane to this, I believe. The Daw Committee, which Roisin obviously chaired, produced the report called Slauncha Care. I'm not going to dwell too much on the contents of the Slauncha Care report here today because Roisin has discussed it in, in a good bit of detail. What I do want to focus on is whether there's any real appetite for meaningful reform of the health service in this country, and particular amongst, and in particular I should say, amongst the key players and vested interests. The Midlands Regional Hospital in Port Leash provides a good example. At least I hope that's where I'm, yes, here. <laughs> Port Leash has been in the headlines for all the wrong reasons in recent years. And in some respects, it's a microcosm of some of the challenges and some of what's wrong in our health service. In Port Leash, we see a lack of accountability political interference, red flags being ignored, a failure to implement key 
recommendations in national reports that were written by the health regulator and a hospital that doesn't have the resources or certainly didn't to safely support some of the activity it was doing and continues to do today. Difficulties in recruiting and retaining key staff were another problem faced at this hospital. These issues and problems are not unique to Port Leash. They're perpetuating the dysfunction that is leading to poor access, long waiting lists, and in some cases, poor and mediocre outcomes. I'm just going to go back a little bit to the primetime report that was broadcast about the tragic deaths of newborn babies at that hospital. Babies died, mistakes were covered up, and parents were treated very badly. I don't believe that this in particular, this specific episode, is something that's happening throughout the health service, and I think it's important to say that, but I'm using Port Leash as a microcosm for the other issues that I've mentioned. Healthcare Hi regulator HICWA was brought in to investigate. In its investigation report, which you can see up on the screen there, HICWA didn't identify or name those who had made serious mistakes, and mistakes were certainly made. HICWA says it is legally precluded from doing this. There are no such limitations in the UK. In Ireland, regrettably, there appears to be very limited accountability. Tony spent some time on this earlier, so I'll try and be as brief as I can, but there are plenty of examples of this throughout the system. Remember Oris Attracta? Here we saw residents being abused, slapped, kicked and shouted at. Again, it was an extreme example of dysfunction and not something you're seeing in every disability home. Instead of hanging their heads in shame, some staff at this facility went to the High Court with the support of their union and secured injunctions against the HSE's internal investigation. At present, the 100,000 plus health service employees are entitled to approve their own investigating teams. And if they don't approve them, the investigations can't go ahead. This, to me, is absolutely incredible. I thought I had, uh, when I first learned about this, I, I thought I was misreading what I was reading. I, I just couldn't, couldn't get over it. The HSE has said that investigations regularly collapse and dismissals are rare. Staff under investigation are often out on full pay for years before they can eventually be dismissed. We continue to have a perverse situation where health service employees have the right to determine who investigates them today. The HSE asked the department to introduce, or to introduce legislation to tackle this. There is absolutely no sign of it. Nobody seems to be able to tell me why. To what extent is this lack of accountability impacting the way in which services are being managed and indeed our soaring cost of claims? Rona alluded to defensive medicine and to the state claims agency earlier on. And she mentioned that our liability for legal claims is now 1.67 billion, up 23%, as you can see from that slide on the previous year. But back to Port Leach, and I'm going to move away from accountability. Port Leach houses one of 29 publicly funded hospital emergency departments. According to clinicians who work in emergency departments, i.e. the Irish Association of Emergency Medicine, we have far too many emergency departments for a country of our size. That's not a popular thing to say, but it's the truth. Emergency department staff need to be able to access specialists in relevant specialties, such as critical care, coronary care, trauma and orthopaedic care. In its report, HICWA was very critical of the 24-hour emergency department at Port Leash Hospital, as it didn't have the necessary resources. HICWA stated that the HSE itself had in 2012 and 2013 specifically identified major clinical risks related to emergency medicine at the hospital. Importantly, HICWA also pointed out that many of its own national recommendations in previous reports just hadn't been implemented. This is what I mean when I say that reports are not implemented. In my own opinion, this has been down to political interference. Port Leash Hospital was chosen by the HSE to have its emergency department designation removed back in 2011. There was significant political interference. More recently, the Dublin Midlands Hospital Group submitted a report to the Department of Health last summer in which it outlined a plan to replace the emergency department with a minor injuries unit. The report has been buried in the vortex that is the Department of Health.
So here we are in 2017, and Port Leash Hospital is still trying to provide a 24-7 emergency department. Port Leash lies, as many of us will know, in a Fine Gael minister's constituency, but other politicians are equally resistant to change. As a result, they're actually condemning local people to mediocrity. If you arrive at Port Leash with a broken hip, there's no orthopedic team to fix you. If you arrive having had a heart attack, doctors there can put in a stent to try and ensure you, you, you live, and it doesn't provide stroke care. So should, should, we be, should we as patients be arriving at this hospital's emergency department? Port Leash is not alone. There are similar deficits at emergency departments elsewhere. It's not good for safety, patient safety. Much of the blame, as I've said, rests with our politicians. But health service management should perhaps stop bowing to political sensibilities. The public, unfortunately, still wants our hospitals to continue to be all things to all people, even though doctors themselves are specialising and subspecialising all the time. The reality is we have too many acute hospitals. Replicating and staffing acute rosters in so many centres is wasteful and it's expensive. We're struggling to staff these hospitals, a point that HICWA made about Port Leash. Recently, the HSC said that 128 doctors who are currently working as consultants throughout the system are not in the specialist register of the Medical Council. In other words, they have not completed specialist training, even though they are employed as specialists. The HSE has admitted that this poses significant risks. The sad reality is that Ireland's health service, as Rona said, is not regarded as an attractive place to work by many of our highly trained doctors. The remuneration on offer is lower than it is elsewhere. It can be difficult to access diagnostics. The working conditions are not regarded as good. Secretarial or administ administ administrative report, support is often lacking. Many consultants, especially those in rural hospitals, face on onerous on-call commitments. Surgeons regularly struggle to access theatre time or operating theatres, and as a result, it's difficult for them to maintain their skills. We have one of the lowest numbers of physicians per thousand population in Europe. This is a real problem, and it's impacting our waiting lists. So what is the system doing to address this? Well, if you'll, if you'll allow me a little anecdote, um, I asked the head of one of our biggest medical unions this very question on Thursday, and I received a two-word response that was short and to the point. It began with an F and ended with all. <laughs> I'm sure most of you grasp that. Unfortunately, this individual is correct. The government has decided to fight consultants who are owed money under their 2008 contract. They're taking them to the High Court, even though, as the Irish Times reported last year, the Attorney General believes they should settle. This is money that was contractually promised to doctors. What kind of a signal is that sending out to people we are trying to recruit and retain? Similarly, we want to move care out of hospitals and into the community, but many of our GPs are nearing retirement and we are not training enough of them. It's hard to see how we can ever hope to create a better health service without enough highly trained doctors. The previous government asked DCU President Brian McCraith to examine medical career structures. He made a series of proposals, many of which have not been implemented some three years later. The same can be said of so many other reports. There's the National Dementia Strategy, the National Carer Strategy, Reach Out, our National uh, Su Suicide Prevention Strategy, A Vision for Change for Mental Health, and I'll go back. <laughs> The list goes on and on. Unfortunately, our national propensity for aspirational report writing has been dwarfed by chronic implementation deficit disorder. <laughs> we, we have been talking about shifting care out of hospitals since Micheál Martin launched the then government's primary care strategy called A New Direction in 2001. It's so long ago, I couldn't actually even find a copy of the report. <laughs> now we have Sláinte Care, 
which also proposes shifting care away from hospitals. Everyone agrees this made sense. You heard Roisin, Rona and Tony all discuss this. And I'm just going to look at one obvious example, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Our admission rates for this disease are enormous. It's a major contributor to the trolley crisis. Professor Tim MacDonald, the HSE's lead for this, said there was a lack of resources in primary care to deal with it, and so we have extraordinary admission rates. There are plenty of other examples that I can give you, but as you can see, Ireland is marked almost at, at the very, very end with a green arrow. We're hugely, hugely over where other countries are. Whilst I think there are very many good things in the Sláinte Care Report, I have to be honest and say that I do share some of the concerns that have been expressed by former HSE Chief Brendan Drum around the costs involved and the HSE's former surgical lead, Professor Frank Keane, around existing structures. Sláinte Care, as Roisin points out, calls for three billion in transitional um, and legacy funding. Much of this is for capital spending. There's no doubt that our capital spend has been woefully inadequate. We spent just a fraction of our overall health spend on capital projects. In 2015, it was just 398 million. When you consider we spent over 19 billion on health, it's a very, very small sum. And you can see that graph which Stephen Kinsella, um, our economist Stephen Kinsella gave to me, the capital spend is in red at the very, very top. It's not good enough. Sláinte Care also proposed a phased ex expansion in health and social care entitlements, which by year five is going to cost an additional 2.1 billion. We are already extraordinarily high spenders on health care, and this is where I personally would have some questions. In 2015, our per capita spend was the third highest in Europe. We also had a hugely high expenditure per capita on pharmaceuticals, as you can see in that graph. OECD figures, and you can see there, Ireland again is in green, and I'm sorry if it's a bit small for some of you, show we spent $5,275, it's done in dollars, in 2015. Next year it looks like we're going to be the second highest expenditure, a spender in current expenditure. The figures are all the more interesting as we have a comparatively young population. In 2015, 13% of the Irish population was over 65 compared to an EU average of 19%. The demand for healthcare increases as we age, so we should arguably be spending less. Where will that leave us as our population ages? And look at the demographic trend we face. In 2013, an OECD survey showed the cost of procedures in Irish public hospitals was the highest of all 26 countries surveyed. The average cost for a knee replacement in a public hospital in Ireland was more than double what it was in Britain. Is it fair to ask all of us to stump up so much more money without a thorough examination of our existing cost base or cost drivers? I'm not so sure. When talking about trying to improve the health service, I also think it's important to reference the challenges and obstacles that are often created by professional groups themselves. More doctors need to change the way they work. The failure to do this is exacerbating inefficiencies. Too many doctors are not doing a sufficient number of ward rounds. They're not seeing their patients early enough. They're not planning discharges early enough. Last time I checked, our national hospital discharge rate by 11 a.m. in the morning was hovering at about 10%. Beds aren't being freed up quickly enough. The demarcation of professional roles is another serious problem. We're struggling to recruit theatre nurses, and yet we cannot hire theatre assistants like they do in so many other countries to plug this gap. Theatre assistants work very well elsewhere, but the Irish Nurses and Midwives Organisation is vehemently opposed to it. In 2016, the INMO secured the restoration of an allowance that would see nurses carry out tasks that are routinely done by nurses in other countries. These tasks included inserting IV cannulas, taking bloods or phlebotomy, um, administering first dose antibiotics and nurse-led discharge. It was a good and practical reform aimed at actually enabling non-consultant hospital doctors to do more difficult tasks, but doctors say it has hardly happened in some hospitals. Vision is clearly important, but changing the system is a painstaking, 
operational challenge. Our inability to act on previous reports, coupled with difficulties health service management faces in actually getting professionals to work differently, does not augur well. Today, Sláinte Care, and I hope I'm sorry, <laughs> I've lost it, um, Sláinte Care is the only show in town. The report has very wisely proposed creating an implementation office in the office of the Taoiseach. This will be key, in my opinion. Will the Taoiseach be willing to take on this responsibility? If he doesn't embrace this and take direct responsibility for it, then I do fear that Sláinte Care will be relegated to a dusty shelf in the Department of Health. Vision without implementation is just hallucination. Thank you all for your attention. <laughs>